I wonder how stressful it is to like, you know, these fr frontier models, like initiate training, like to have the code, push the button. <laughs> to push the button that like you're now spending a, a large amount of money and time to train this. Like there must, I mean, th th there must be a lot of innovation on the debugging stage of like making sure there's no issues that you're monitoring and visualizing every aspect of the training all that kind of stuff. When, when people are training, they have all these various dashboards, but yeah. like the <laughs> most simple one is your loss, right? right. Uh, and it continues to go down, but in reality, especially with more complicated stuff like MOE, the biggest problem with it, or FP8 training, which is another innovation, you know, going to a lower precision number format, i.e. less accurate, is that you end up with loss spikes. Right. And and no one knows why the loss spike happened. And for no, a long time. Some of them you do. Some of them you some do. Some of them are bad data. Do I give a AI2's example of what blew up our earlier models is a subreddit called Microwave Gang. We love to shout <laughs> out this out. It's a real thing. You can pull up Microwave Gang. Essentially, it's a subreddit where everybody makes posts that are just the letter M. So it's like, mmm. So there's extremely <laughs> long sequences yeah. of the letter Sorry. M. Yeah. And then the comments are like beep beep because it's in the microwave events. Yeah. But if you pass this into a model that's trained to be a normal producing text, it's extremely extremely high loss because yeah. normally you see an M, you don't <laughs> predict M's for a long time. Yeah. So like this is something that caused a lot of spikes for us. But when you have much like this is this is old, this is not recent. And when you have more mature data systems, that's not the thing that causes the loss spike. And what Dylan is saying is true, but it's like it's it's levels to this sort of idea. <laughs> with regards to the stress, right? Like, <laughs> these people are like, you know, you'll go out to dinner with like a friend that works at one of these labs and they'll just be like, they'll just be like looking at their phone every like 10 minutes and they're not like, you know, it's one thing if they're texting, but they're just like, yeah. like, is the loss? Is the yeah, loss it's literally like tokens, loss per, tokens per second, loss not blown up. They're just walking, watching this. <laughs> and the heart rate goes up if there's a spike. And some level of spikes is normal, right? It'll it'll recover and be back. Sometimes a lot of the old strategy was like, you just stop the run, restart from an old version, and then like change the data mix, and then it keeps going. There are even different types of spikes. So Dirk Greneveld has a theory at AI too that's like fast spikes and slow spikes, where there are sometimes where you're looking at the loss and there are other parameters, you can see it start to creep up and then blow up, and that's really hard to recover from, so you have to go back much further. So you have the stressful period where it's like flat, or it might start going up, and you're like, what do I do? Whereas there are also lost spikes that are, it looks good, and then there's one spiky data point, and what you could do is you just skip those. You you see that there's a spike, you're like, okay, I can ignore this data, don't update the model, and do the next one, and it'll recover quickly. But these like, on trickier implementations, so as you get more complex in your architecture, and you scale up to more GPUs, you have more potential for your loss blowing up. So it's like, there's there's and then, and then there's a distribution. The whole idea of grokking also comes in, right? It's like, just because it slowed down from improving and loss doesn't mean it's not learning because all of a sudden it could be like this and it could just spike down and loss again because it learned, truly learned something, right? Uh, and it took some time for it to learn that. It's not like a gradual process, right? And that's that's what humans are like. That's what models are like. So it's it's really a stressful task, as you mentioned. <laughs> and the whole time, the, the the dollar count is going up. Every company has failed runs. You need failed run to push the envelope on your infrastructure. So a lot of news cycles are made of X company had Y failed run. Every company that's trying to push the frontier of AI has these. So it is, yes, it's noteworthy because it's a lot of money and it can be week to month setback, but it is part of the process. But how do you get, if you're deep seek, how do you get to a place where, holy shit, there's a successful combination of hyperparameters? A lot of small failed runs. And so so <laughs> rapid... Uh, iteration through failed runs yeah, until and, and successful ones. You just and then you build up some intuition like this. This mixture of expert works, and then this implementation of MLA works. Key hyperparameters like learning rate and regularization and things like this, and you find the regime that works for your code base. I've talking to people at Frontier Labs. There's a story that you can tell where training language models is kind of a path that you need to follow. So you need to like unlock the ability to train a certain type of model or a certain scale, and then your code base and your internal know-how of which hyperparameters work for it is kind of known. And I, you look at the DeepSeek papers and models, they've, they've scaled up, they've added complexity, and it's just continuing to build the capabilities that they have. There, there's the concept of a YOLO run. <laughs> um, so YOLO, you only live once. Yep. Um, and, and what it is, is like, you know, there's, there's, there's all this experimentation you do at the small scale, right? Uh, research ablations, right? Like you have your Jupyter notebook where you're experimenting with MLA on like three GPUs or whatever. Um, and you're doing all these different 
uh, things like, hey, do I do four expert, four active experts, 128 experts? Do I arrange the experts this way? You know, all these different uh, model architecture things you're testing at a very small scale, right? A couple researchers, few GPUs, tens of GPUs, hundreds of GPUs, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, guys, no more, no more fucking around, right? Uh, no more screwing around. Everyone take all the resources we have. Let's pick what we think will work and just go for it, right? YOLO. Yeah. And this is where that sort of stress comes in is like, well, I know it works here, but some things that work here don't work here. And some things that work here don't work down here, right? In yeah. this terms of scale, right? So it's 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 really truly a YOLO run. And and sort of like there is this like like discussion of like certain researchers just have like this methodical nature, like they can find the whole search space and like figure out all the ablations of different research and really see what is best. And there's certain researchers who just kind of like you know, have that innate gut instinct of like, this is the YOLO run. Like, you know, I'm looking Brad at the data, I think the this is it. Uh, this is why you want to work in post-training because the GPU cost for training is lower. So you can make a higher percentage of your training runs YOLO runs. Yeah. For, for now. Yeah, for now. <laughs> for now. For for now. now. <laughs> so some of this uh, is fundamentally luck still. Luck is skill, right? In many cases. Yeah, I mean, it looks lucky, right? When you're... But the hill to climb... If you're at one of these labs, and you have an evaluation you're not crushing. There's a repeated playbook of how you improve things. There are localized improvements, which might be data improvements, and these add up into the whole model just being much better. And when you zoom in really close, it can be really obvious that this model is just really bad at this thing and we can fix it. And you just add these up. So like, some of it feels like luck, but on the ground, especially with these new reasoning models we're talking to, it's just so many ways that we can poke around and normally it's that some of them give big improvements the, the search space is near infinite right and and yet the amount of compute and time you have is is very low and you're you're you have to hit release schedules you have to not get blown past by everyone otherwise you know what happened with deep seek you know crushing meta and mistral and cohere and all these guys they move too slow right they they maybe were too methodical i don't know they didn't hit the yolo run whatever the reason was maybe they weren't as skilled uh, whatever, whatever, you know, you can call it luck if you want, but in, in, at the end of the day, it's skill. So 2025 is the year of the YOLO run. It seems like all the labs are like going in. I, I, th I think it's even more impressive what OpenAI did in 2022. Right at the time, no one believed in mixture of experts models. Right at Google, uh, who had all the researchers, uh, OpenAI had such little compute, and they devoted all of their compute for many months, right? All of it, 100% for many months to GPT-4 with a brand new architecture with no belief that, hey, let me spend a couple hundred million dollars, which is all of the money I have on this model, right? That is truly YOLO, yeah. right? Um, <laughs> yeah. Now, now, you know, people are like, all these like training run failures that are in the media, right? It's like, okay, great. But like actually a lot, a huge chunk of my GPs are doing inference. I still have a bunch doing research constantly. And yes, my biggest cluster is training, but like on, on this YOLO run, but like that YOLO run is much less risky than like what OpenAI did in 2022 or maybe what DeepSeek did now or, you know, like sort of like, hey, we're just going to throw everything at it. The big winners throughout human history are the ones who are willing to do YOLO at some point.